Hello, I'm Mark Gotham here to report on the Beethoven X project, commissioned by Deutsche Telekom to create some kind of realisation of Beethoven's scant fragmentary plans for a 10th symphony. How do we get from material like this? Beethoven's few clear musical sketches, and even more cryptically, material like this, his sketches in words, to this, the final performance which took place in October of 2021. In particular, we might ask how can we do this? What are the necessary practicalities involved? How should we do this? What constitutes success in emulating a particular style? And perhaps most importantly, how might we want to do this? What kinds of human computer collaborations and interactions are involved here? What are suitable tasks for humans, suitable tasks for computers? And what implications might this have for the future of automatic composition? This is a very interesting project and case study to think through and it connects very well with AIMC's conference theme this year. In this brief presentation, I'll start with the starting points, how we make any kinds of inroads on this project, move on to some of the tasks we set the computer to accomplish, which tasks we thought were appropriate for the computer and which we reserved for humans, and a little bit of an overview of the computational architectures involved. So those starting points then, and beginning with the musical sketches. This is a very exciting page in which Beethoven seems to sketch out the themes for a scherzo and trio pair. The first thing we need to do is to get this into some kind of computational format that we can work with. But this is no neutral matter. The solution here emphasises a possible tessellation of a motif that goes a fourth up, a step down, a fourth up, a step down. This is preferred partly in relation to other late style melodies, perhaps the slow movement of the ninth, the fugal theme in the opus 110 sonata, and perhaps even the esmor sign. Considerably more deduction is needed to make any sense of Beethoven's textual sketches in planning this work. In this very exciting early sketch, Beethoven sets out many ideas, possibly for the ninth, possibly for the tenth, possibly for no work at all. He makes specific reference to music in den alten Tonan, in the old church modes. And this is exciting partly because it doesn't really feature in the ninth, but is a subject that Beethoven was interested in the time, explicitly labelling this movement as being in the Lydian mode, for example. More specifically still, Beethoven refers to the Herrgottlich Lobenwehr, the German form of the Te Deum, which he likely knew the chant for in some form like this. So reading the text sketches potentially leads us to an altogether new musical theme to work with. This look back to older musical styles is notable partly because Beethoven is one of relatively few composers interested in this at the time, and also because it potentially connects with a wider theme of retrospection that seems to be evident in the work. Most clearly in his sketch for a slow movement theme, that closely resembles the slow movement of his early pathetic sonata. Having gathered together the sketches for this work and got some sense of the kinds of material or styles we we're attempting to write in, we could start to populate corpora for learning these styles. And these subcorpora can be specific to the particular task at hand, for instance, to learn fugal writing. In populating a corpus of relevant examples for Beethoven's fugal style, we would of course start with the movements by Beethoven called fugues, 
such as the Opus 35 finale. But relatively quickly, we get from this kind of material into juvenilia exercises and the like. So we may wish to extend to partial works from the piano sonatas, from the symphonies. In any case, we have a lot of decisions to make about what our corpus should include, whether we should prioritise works by Beethoven himself or other composers, whether we should prioritise orchestral works, complete works, and so on. We could also perhaps part on this bottom-up approach of creating music in a particular style for a particular section with a more top-down approach of an overview for the kind of structure that we're aiming for. Even in traditional non-computational forms of these completion tasks, it's common to see attention given to how long movements and their large sections are to give a sense of the kind of balance we're aiming for overall. A more detailed version of this is possible by encoding the entire formal structure of a movement. This in turn makes it possible to produce computational comparisons of the structure of different movements. Producing these formal analyses automatically is an open area of research, and there is a great deal to be said at this stage for learning from computational encodings of human analyses. We turn now to the setting of specific generation tasks, and among the many ways in which one could approach this, we choose to divide the overall task into three broad subtasks. The extension of fragmentary short sketches, usually for melodies or other sparse textures, into full longer melodies. The addition to that of accompanimental voices of some kind, counter contrapuntal or harmonic. And finally, the mapping of this to a full orchestral score. Let's start with the task of extending a short melody into a longer one. Ideally here, we need a corpus of relevant examples, melodies by Beethoven, perhaps specifically orchestral. In populating that corpus, we have to ask ourselves what counts. Sometimes this is clear, as for example in hymns, but in orchestral works, it can be a complicated matter to identify where the melody is. There's a lot to be said for identifying where the melody is, stitching that together into one melodic part and learning from this as melodic material rather than simply training the system on every single part melodic and otherwise. In order to produce this, we have to decide whether to use an algorithm that's automatable at scale, but perhaps not so subtle in its reasoning, or to use human analysts marking up where they think the most important melodic part is at every stage. We turn now to another kind of task, the adding of accompanimental or secondary lines to that existing melody. Earlier we discussed the creation of a fugue dataset. From this, or some kind of wider counterpoint dataset, we can learn directly from the scores, perhaps simply by pairs of parts. This could be constrained, for instance, to handle the special case of the lowest bass voice. For a more harmonic style of accompaniment, we perhaps do best to learn not so much directly from the score, but again from human harmonic analyses of that score. There are automatic approaches to producing these analyses, but again I think it's fair to say the best state of the art today is built in turn on corpora produced by humans. Finally, the task of orchestration can broadly be viewed as the mapping from a short score in few staves to a full orchestral score. Alternatively, 
we could view this as a reverse engineering problem, as we have relatively many orchestral scores available and relatively few reduced scores of exactly the kind of density that we need, we could perhaps start with those orchestral scores, identify where material is doubled, and then produce algorithms for reducing these orchestral scores into short scores of the right kinds of density to correspond to the newly generated material, such that we can then create a machine learning system for generating orchestral scores from those generations. At this point, we're clearly talking about highly computational processes, but again, as always, there is a high degree of human involvement in the specific design of those algorithms. For example, how important are the various elements in that original orchestral score? Which are the most expendable? How far should we reduce down? Finally, a very brief overview of the machine learning architectures used. For the continuation and extension of a melodic line, we considered this problem closely related to natural language processing models for predicting next words in sequences and developed a system based on Transformer XL. For the harmonization task, we created a system based on an analogy to machine translation, translating in this task between the condition of melody and harmony. We find this to be a useful analogy, but there are differences to be sure. For example, in translating between two languages, the word order is often changed, whereas in melodic to harmonic translation, the order needs to be preserved. For bridging between two passages of music, or else replacing a short segment that is considered undesirable for whatever reason, we developed a system based on BERT in which short passages are randomly masked out from the training corpus to learn how these are typically filled in. And the orchestration model works in a similar way, where the known element is pitch, duration, and so on, and the unknown element is the orchestral allocation. Let's conclude by zooming out to those much broader questions that we started with. First, let's emphasize how many important decisions and roles there have been for humans at every stage in the design and implementation of this process. And ask ourselves which of these we would like to improve the algorithms for automating and which we would like to leave as human judgment calls. Once this system is set up, it's eminently possible to have a very interactive back and forth where new generations are effectively produced to order. And as always, we might ask ourselves what these computational processes have taught us about musical structure, about creativity, about style-specific questions, and much more besides. Thanks very much to Deutsche Telekom for the commission, for the many team members involved in the project, and for you for your attention. Please see the paper for more information.